excited about this series. I'm excited about um, just what God's laid on my heart for this season, the series that we're on. Um, just as I was preparing for it, digging into it, like it just kept stirring in me. I'm just, you know, part of this, I'm, I'm looking at the history of Crossroads, like the, the decades and nearly centuries, the legacy that this church has had in the community, the things this church has done in our community, for our community. It's just been really cool. And, and as I studied, as I've looked into that, like it just stirs in my heart that God is not done with our church yet that God is not done with this community, that God still wants to do more, do more in us and more through us because there's still more people that need to know Jesus and there's still more people that need to come closer to Jesus. And I know that God has chosen Crossroads as an avenue for some of that to happen. So in this series, a big part of the challenge that I have for you, I'll just throw it out there early on. If you get mad, leave now. Just try not to maze a when you do. Turn the screen off, whatever you need to do. But here's where I think we're going. I think that God is challenging us, Crossroads Community Church, corporately and as individuals, to allow God's space to grow us, to, to allow God's space to stretch us, to reach like never before, and to do things that maybe we've never done before. I believe to the core of one of the reasons, one of the large reasons that my wife and my family, we moved over here to Crossroads six years ago, was because of the mission of the church, to meet people where they are, to help them take their next step with Christ. Realizing that for some people, that might be like step one. Like, I just put my faith in Jesus. What's next? For some of us, that might be step 22,356. What's next? And even for some people, that might be like a step closer to meeting Jesus. But I love that we all are somewhere on the continuum. That we all have a next step to take. But as long as we're breathing, there is a next step for me and for you on this planet. And for our church, for Crossroads to continue to grow and to stretch and to reach like never before, I think that we have to be willing as a church to take steps of growth and maturity. And as individuals and able to reach more of our potential, to realize more of God's plans and purposes for our life, we have to strategically and intentionally take steps closer to Jesus. The title of the series is called Firing on All Cylinders. And the reference being that if we're going to come to this community with the horsepower we need, We're going to need to fire on all cylinders. We're going to need to put our preparations and our purposes and our strategies all in line to be able to fire on all cylinders to help every man, woman, and child in our community take their next step with Christ. Now, I apologize because this survey is a little bit older than I like to use. It's a few years back. It's the most current one I can find, and I really believe that statistically it's probably pretty accurate, maybe even a little bit worse. But a a large research company did a survey a couple years ago surveying like North American Christians, And they found that 80% of Christians in our country take one step after putting their faith in Jesus. Either getting plugged into a church, typically baptism, maybe some combinations. But 80% of Christians in North America stop at that point. They never get closer to Jesus. They never take another step in spiritual maturity or formation than after they get baptized. That means only 20% of people are continuing to pursue Jesus after baptism. Like, I, I found Jesus I got some, some, some fire insurance, I show up at church a few times, I get dunked, I go public with my faith, and then I can just coast. I can just go through the motions, show up when I feel like it, not take it real serious, just spend the rest of my days on earth in neutral, not really going anywhere. Can, can I just say that if we as individuals and we as a church, if we're going to make a kingdom impact, it's not going to happen coasting. It's not going to happen if we aren't firing on all cylinders. It's not going to happen if we haven't postured and positioned ourselves for God to grow in us and work through us into our community. So in the New Testament, there's this writer, Paul. He wrote a big chunk of the New Testament. He gives us all kinds of instruction. He, he plants churches, and then he tells us and gives us instruction and correction for how to, how to run a church and exist as a church and to be a church, the gathering of believers. And so much of what Paul writes in the New Testament is really specific to, like, as a church— This is what we do. In this particular part of his letter, in this one particular letter in in Ephesians, Paul writes and gives us instruction on how to build and strengthen the body of believers. And he talks about how we work in unity. Well, we, we may not all have the same perspective, but we come together to accomplish the mission that God has called us to do. And he talks about specifically like each piece working together as part of this. And he even gets into like the maturity that we have to grow as believers. It's in your Bible. It's on the screens. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. He writes, Then we will no longer be immature like children, because we won't be tossed around and blown around by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Verse 15. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing 
in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. Verse 16, he, he, Jesus, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work, as each person does their own special work, it helps the other parts to grow so that the whole body is healthy, growing, and full of love. What an incredible assignment that God has given us. As long as you exist on this planet, there is growth for you to take hold of. As long as we are breathing on this planet, there is growth still for us to take. I believe that it's God's desire, not that just we come to put our faith in Jesus. It's the most important decision you'll ever make, but that after we do, we continue to grow. And here's what I believe to be true. If God's only intent was just to save us, to redeem us, restore us, at the moment of salvation, he would have scooped us up into heaven where we regarded, protected, loved, and in his pr- proximity. But maybe, maybe elbow your neighbor real quick. We still here. And if we're still here, I believe because God has purposes for us more so than just salvation. Don't mishear that. Salvation is the most important part of our journey, but you're still here. God's got more for you. God's got more purpose and plans for you. God's got more things within your reach with him working through you to do so. So in that purpose, if we're going to realize the things that God still got us here for, we're going to have to be willing to grow and to stretch and to reach and to trust and to mature in our faith. And that gets me excited. What if 12 months from now, what would our community look like a year from now if every single person at Crossroads committed to growing and maturing in their faith? Now, that's not a public shaming thing like, why don't y'all start growing up a little bit like we do to our kids sometimes. That's realizing that all of us are somewhere on this spiritual continuum. And we have another step to take. What if we intentionally postured in a position to ourselves to where God could work in us so that God could work through us like never before? And that excites me as a church to know that we can start to grow in that way. What if as individuals, what if we purposed and intended over the next 12 months to take steps of trusting Jesus, pursuing our Father like never before so that God could grow in us, mature and grow up in us like never before? What if our church, what if individuals, we committed to learning, to get to a greater understanding of who God is and how God operates? What if we committed to, to pursuing and realizing more of the purpose and plans that God has for us? What if we committed to reaching like never before those that are far from Christ and discipling those who are found? I believe that this church still has great things in store for this community. I believe that God is growing up people and stretching people and maturing believers to pursue Christ and to grow the kingdom. Man, how crazy would that be? And I know to get there, where we are now is fine, but it can't be where we're content to remain. There is another step for each and every one of us. Paul said it, each one does their own special work. It helps the other parts to grow so the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So today I want to start this series off by just looking at a few ways that God likes to grow us, to stretch us, to, to impart maturity in us. Now let's just let's get this out of the way that the growing isn't easy. Well, let, me, let me rephrase that. Good growing isn't easy. Um, I've learned in the last five years, I'm still growing. I've grown an armrest right here. This is not what I wanted to grow. No intent of that. It was easy for me to grow this. That's not good growth. Good growth isn't easy. In fact, on this planet, nothing good ever comes easy. It takes intentionality. It takes purpose. It takes focus. And we know because of that that we're going to face barriers and obstacles that get in our way to prevent us from growing and maturing in our faith. So in your notes, we wrote a few of those down. A couple of the obstacles, probably nothing new, maybe just a reminder for you, but sometimes we forget the simplicity of the devil's schemes to prevent us from growing and maturing in our faith. So there's a couple of them in there. The first one are failures. The failures of our past are great at preventing us from growing into our future. Like it's easy to get stuck in the conversation in your head about the times we've messed up, about the time we tried and failed, about the time where we tried and we lost, where it cost us something and for what. And when we start to think about stretching and growing in our faith and reaching places or investing time that we've never done before, our failures can quickly develop a sense of power and urgency in our mind. The failures of our past work really hard to keep us growing into our future. They keep us from doing things. They prevent us from making changes. They prevent us from going and trying to do something in a different way. They freeze us in the pain and the fear of repeating what's already happened in a negative way. But here's the thing. The power that failures of our past possess only exists when we give it permission to. 
You see, when we ask God for forgiveness, Scripture tells us often, when God forgives us, he removes it from his remembrance. He forgets far, as far as the east is from the west. So when, when failures stir up and prevent us from taking steps of growth, it's simply because we have chosen to acknowledge and remember those fears as an obstacle. I'm going to encourage you today, church, let, let God remove that. Stop looking so much back in the past and let God lead you into the future. As you read through the scriptures, other than Jesus, every character we read about in the scriptures has a past failure, some of them multiple. And then we read that God showed up, and when God showed up, he redeemed, and he restored, and he empowered, and he equipped, and he trained, and he sent these imperfect people out to change the world. It keeps us preventing on purpose. Don't let your past failures prevent you from growing. The second one is our filter. We all have a filter, a lens that we view life through, a perspective that we possess. It may be the way we see things, the way we hear things, the way we feel about things. Right now, I could argue that everyone who can hear my voice is hearing it the same way, but we know that's not true. Because, like, for, if you, for example, if you and I have a relationship, you're hearing what I say differently than, than maybe someone who's never heard me before. And if you've got a good history with me, you're going you're gonna to take what I say a little different. And if we don't have a great history, you're going to take a little bit spiced too. Like our filter affects the way we perceive things. We all have a filter in everything that we do, how we see it, how we process it, how we remember it, past conversations, past events. They all meld together to form a filter that we see life through. One of the reasons that spiritual freedom is such a great and powerful gift from our God is that spiritual freedom heals our heart, and the healed heart changes the filter we see life through. It changes the way we see ourselves. It changes the way we see others. It changes the way we see our God. I'm not telling you that you have to go through a whole list of things to be able to set yourself up for God to do healing. Oftentimes, God does his miraculous work in healing in our heart in just a moment, but sometimes it requires us to create space in our lives to allow God to do his healing work. Sometimes we get so busy trying to pursue God and put him into our box the way we want to encounter God that we forget our God, the creator of all things, is so widespread and vast in how he can connect with us and approach us. And he wants so badly to do a healing work in us so that it's good for us, but also that it changes our filter. And we just want to see God through this narrow tunnel. Church, I would encourage you today to create space, to create bandwidth where this isn't a barrier for you anymore, that God can really start to do a healing work in your heart and in your mind so that the way we see changes. The second barrier, third barrier, our fears. It's the one we don't like to talk about. We all like to be tough and strong, but if we're being honest, most of us, we get stuck in this barrier of fear. We just don't want to try. We're afraid what we're going to lose. We're afraid of what it might cost. We're afraid what would happen if it doesn't work, or worse, if something bad happens as a result. And so much of us, we, we miss out on the maturity and growth in our faith because we're, just, we're scared. We lack the confidence that what we're doing is really going to work, that God's really going to grow. The last one, if you've cracked my code, the last F in faith growth class, our fatigue. I just don't have time. I just don't have energy. I'm just too busy. Like we, we as Christians, we live with the best intentions. And often the best intentions lead us to the biggest barriers of growth in our faith. We had this good intention of doing this, and then something seemingly more important popped up, and it took my time, and it took my attention. And church, I want to challenge us. we got to get aggressive and passionate about prioritizing our faith maturity. we got to get intentional about opening ourselves up, prioritizing the right things so that God has the space. Not because God's limited in what he can do, but if we close God off, he's not going to force his way in. we got to get intentional about allowing God to do that. In fact, if you're on the app, if you're on our Crossroads app, there's a link right there on our page, or you can get this at ecrossroads.info as well to help us each identify what a great next step for us to take is. There's a spiritual evaluation trying to figure out like, okay, so here's where I am, and here's a great step for me to take from here. Again, not public shame, and we understand people are all along this faith continuum, but we each have a step to take. We each have an opportunity. In fact, if you're in the room today and you leave later today and you walk out, take a ride at the next step place, there's actually printed copies of your next step guide. We, we want to help you every way that we can to take our next step of growth and maturity in our faith. Why? Because growth doesn't happen just because it should. Like there's a part of our physical being where like as we get older, we, we tend to just mature naturally. Spiritual growth doesn't necessarily happen like that. Being a longtime Christian doesn't make us mature. Being being someone who's experienced in Christianity doesn't mean that we're, we're mature. Growth happens when we 
posture and position ourselves where we can hear from God, where God can speak to us, where we can learn from God in the godly influences that he brings in our life, where we can encounter God. So wherever you are on your faith journey, I, I wrote this in the notes, and I know it's really, really simple, and I know it's really maybe even juvenile trivial, but I think it's worth writing down as a reminder, I, each of us, I have a next step to take in my maturity. It's not an insult. That's not a dig. That's a man, there's a whole other world out in front of us who needs to know Jesus and know him more. And if I'm going to get there, if I'm going to help, then I have another step to take, a next step in my maturity. Parents, we've been there before, right? Like, as a parent, especially as you raise some older kids, like, you feel like you have poured into them, man, all of the goodness and greatness of what's inside of you. And then there's that one moment where they say something, or they do something, or they look at you that way, and you're just like, maybe you even verbalize it. How are you so immature? Any other parents feel like that? Nope. Okay, just me. Perfect. Maybe the other side is true for you, because sometimes it's true for me. You sit back, you're listening to your kiddos, and they say something, and they do something, and they act on something. They, ex- they, they use some wisdom that, like, somewhere you've been sowing that for decades, and they finally caught on, and they do it, and you're like, my baby, my baby, she's so grown up. She's all, she's all mature. Like, I just have this visual of, like, God just watching us step out in maturity to love others, to forgive, to be kind, to be generous. I see God, like, that's the maturity I'm talking about. That's what I've been raising you up to. I, just, I feel like God just, just like oozes joy when he sees that maturity come out in us. Our, our Heavenly Father, I believe God wants to see his kids mature and to grow. We read it already, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Instead, we'll speak the truth in love, growing in every way to be more and more like Christ. That, that doesn't come with an expiration date. That doesn't come with a you have arrived sticker until we get to heaven. There is growth steps for each of us to take. So full disclaimer, it's in your notes. The growth ahead of me may not always come in the avenue I want it to come. Uh, There are times in our minds, and maybe I'm the only one that does this, but sometimes I create plans, agendas, and strategies in my mind of how this next faith growth step is going to happen. Like in our home, I've sat down hundreds of times with this big elaborate strategy of how we're going to disciple each one of our kids individually. And it works maybe one day or two, and then something else pops in, pops out, doesn't work, shuts it down. Well, that backfired. Most of us, we just back away like, okay, that's not going to work. But God often uses other avenues than we anticipate to grow us and develop us. God, creator of all things, is not limited to my understanding of technology or leading or teaching or developing or stretching that my tiny little brain thinks is the only way God can grow me. I warn people all the time, if you are asking God to help you mature in your patience, it's a good spiritual gift, we should all do that. Typically, God's not going to operate in the, if you pray for patience, I will supernaturally impart patience into you. Typically, if you pray and say, God, help me to be more patient, God will provide more opportunities for you to exercise patience. That's frustrating, but it helps us to learn, to grow, and to stretch. I I recommend to people all the time, if you're begging and pleading and maybe spending hours praying for a relationship to improve, and most of your prayer content involves God, just change them. You're probably not going to get the results you're looking for. You're going to have much more effectiveness in your prayer If your prayer for the relationship is, God, help me to change. Got awful quiet in this here church today. It's a good spot for an amen right there, church. I mean, that's how God works. He he brings opportunities in to grow, to stretch, and develop us. So so my prayer for our church is that each of us position ourselves, posture ourselves, prepared for God to work on our heart, to work in our mind, to grow to develop, to mature, that we humble ourselves to know that there's going to be opportunities that made sense for God to grow me, and there's going to be impractical ways that God shows up to grow me, that there's going to be people that come into my life, and yeah, that made sense, and there's going to be people that come into my life, and I didn't anticipate that, but because of the humble heart, I seek God, and he grows us. I have a next step to take. You have a next step to take. We have things that need to happen. There are challenges and changes that need to come our way. Somebody says, but hold on, Pastor, I thought God loved me just the way I am. Yep, absolutely. God loves you just the way you are. But when you come to put your faith in Jesus, God accepts you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. He loves you too much to leave you in the place where you are. Not that where you are could be all that bad. It might be quite good, but there's better. There's more. There's greater things in store. 
for us. Scripture gives us a lot of ways how we grow, so today I want to talk about just a few. In your notes, number one, growth. Growth happens with actions and not just ideas. There's a misconception, and, and don't, don't hear part of this. Make sure you catch all this. There's this misconception that faith maturity is brought to you by studying. Like, if I can just gain more knowledge, if I can gain more content, then I will automatically mature in my faith. Knowledge and understanding are crucial and foundational to faith growth, but that's not it. That's the foundation of the house. That's not where you're going to live. Knowledge is important. Study is important. Expanding what we understand is crucial. But if what I learn here doesn't make it to here and eventually to here, then what was it all for anyway? There is a part of this where maturity says I have to put in action. In fact, maturity is revealed in how I put faith into action. James, Jesus' younger brother, his half-brother, he says it better than I do. James chapter 1, verse 22. He says, but don't just listen to God's word, but do what it says. Otherwise, you're just fooling yourselves. No, nobody I know, nobody sitting in the room, nobody listening online. But some Christians have this understanding, this belief, that the more I learn, the more mature I am in my faith. James says it's not just about what you know, it's about what you do with what you know. 16 years old, my dad and my grandpa and I, we rebuild an old truck and it becomes my truck. And it's, it's a truck. It gets you from A to B, right? And because it gets from A to B and because my dad paid for it and paid the gas for it, I, I was my dad's chauffeur anytime he needed something. So my dad comes up a few months later and he's like, did you go to this town? It's a little farther away. and you get some parts? Bring them back for me. So I'm like, sure, whatever. So I pick up the phone. Uh, young people, there's this thing where you used to pick it up and dial numbers. And then you actually talked into it and you could hear people in your ear. It's crazy. It's not like this. So I call my buddy, and I'm like, hey, man, I'm getting ready to drive by your house. I'm going to this town, and I'm going to pick up some stuff from my dad. You want to hang out? And he's like, absolutely. I'll meet you at the driveway. So I swing by his house, pick him up. We take off through some backcountry roads. Now, I'm, I'm, typically, I'm a fast driver. My apologies to the police officers. But this particular day, I was being a good citizen. I was like 45, 50 tops. Like, I'm on unfamiliar roads. I'm not that confident in my driving quite yet. And we're cruising down the back road, and I see the sign that says railroad crossing. Now, Illinois, much like Indiana, you can see about 20 miles in every direction. So I look over this way, no trains. Look over this way, no trains. All ahead full speed as usual. And then at that moment, we hit the railroad tracks. Much like the BMX competitors in the Olympics, I just soar. <laughs> Instantly, life goes into slow motion. Like, no! We're cruising for about 45 minutes through the air. Thank you for joining your ways. Finally crash into the ground, all four wheels smash down. Somehow I get control, slam on the brakes. We're sliding on the road. Okay, deep breath, dust settles. And my buddy, who had his seatbelt on, somehow slid out of his seatbelt into the floorboard of the truck in the fetal position. <laughs> and when everything finally stops and the truck is shut off and, okay, my heart is beating inside my chest once again, he looks up at me and says, oh, yeah, I knew those, those tracks were rough. I meant to tell you. Knowing is important, but it doesn't help anyone else. If you can't present what you know to someone, if you can't act on what you know, it's not so beneficial. It's a good thing to know, to understand, to grow in your understanding, to grow in your knowledge, but that's not where my responsibility ends. My job is to act, to put what I know, what I've learned from God's word in action, in motion, and maturity is grown and built in actions of God's word. Knowing is valuable. Acting on it, important. Let's not just be knowers of the word. Let's not just be people that know how to take a next step. Let's not just be people that are content with listening. Let's be doers. Let's put faith into action. Let's put the word of God in practice in our lives. Let's be intentional about taking maturity steps by taking steps of action, putting it into action. Understanding, look, look, this is, knowing a lot doesn't mean mature. Having a great understanding doesn't mean mature. Jesus actually talked about it. He explained it. John wrote it down for us. John chapter 15, verse 8. Jesus said it like this. When you produce fruit, much fruit, th then you are my true disciples. And it brings great glory and honor to my Father. Jesus said, look, it's, it's not because you show up for church every Sunday that makes you a mature believer. That's good. Don't, don't misunderstand. Like, coming to church is good. Jesus didn't say memorizing a bunch of scriptures is what makes you a mature believer. It's good. It's important. It's good to hide God's word in your heart. He didn't say when you've been a Christian long enough, then you become my true disciples. He said, listen, it's when you produce fruit. It's when you bring a crop from what you've known. We get this. Like, 
it's an important deal. We're, we're farm community. Like, we understand when we plant a seed of corn, that it should grow, and then when it reaches maturity, it produces a bunch more seeds of corn. Like, that's an important thing. Like, we understand this is a great return on investment, that in maturity, we can plant one and get maybe a full ear, maybe a good crop, two full ears, maybe a crazy crop, two and a half full ears. Like, this is a big deal. Jesus says, listen, if you want to show and reveal your maturity, then you're going to produce good fruit. It's a sign of true discipleship. If you matured in a way where you're producing much fruit. Number two, good way to grow. Growth happens in right environments. Growth happens in right environments. I'll go back to the seed illustration. If I don't plant this seed in the right soil, if I don't plant this seed in soil where it can grow, where it can, where it can germinate, where it can, where it can start to sprout and eventually mature and grow into a, a good corn stalk, if we don't, if we don't surround ourselves with the right things, if we don't embed ourselves with the right things, if we don't surround ourselves with the right people, if we aren't intentional about where we are, where, where we are matters, we're not going to grow. We're not going to produce fruit. We want every gathering, every time believers gather together, large groups and small groups, online and offline, every time Christ followers, the believers get together, we want it to be an environment that promotes growth. Now, that doesn't just mean we're, we're going to grow where the, where the word is preached in a way where it really resonates with me. That's important, but we're going to grow in relationships. We're going to grow by our prayer. We're going to grow by our worship. We're going to grow in so many ways because we're going to be intentional about posturing, positioning ourselves to where God can work in me. God's got the space in me where he can go. So every time we show up, we want people to be able to learn. We want people to connect with God. We want people to be able to worship and to pray. We want people to hear from God, to know they are loved, to know they belong, and to feel encouraged. My job is to be an encourager to help you get farther down the road in your faith journey than you ever could before. Not because I'm special. My mom tells me I'm special. That's good enough for me. But because God has placed me in this role to help encourage you, just like Paul teaches us about. Romans chapter 12, Paul gives more instruction to what it looks like to the church and how the church should work together. And he he starts to talk about these guys like, man, I can't wait till I come see you. Paul longed to go to Rome and to talk to the churches that he had planted. And he's excited about it. And he says in Romans chapter 1 verse 12, he says, when we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by your faith. Growth happens when we intentionally surround ourselves with right people, but it goes both ways. Church folks have been around for a long time. You've heard the terminology. Well, you know, I used to go to this church. I used to go to that church, but I just wasn't being fed. Oh, that gets me every time. This is just a sidebar. Nobody I know knows this. This is just people I used to know a long time ago. If we're mature enough in our faith to realize that we're not being fed, we're probably mature enough in our faith to understand there are more things on the menu than just a Sunday morning preacher. I'm just saying, like, when Paul says, we could argue Paul knows more about the church than anyone else on the earth ever except Jesus. And when Paul says, when I'm with you, I want to encourage you, but I also want to be encouraged by you. Paul knew that being with good Christian folks was going to build him and build his faith and encourage him as well. He knew that there's more facets to the gathering. Preach, good preaching is good. It's important. I will do my best every time I'm on this platform to be God's vessel to speak the truth from his scripture to you. But there are so many ways in a gathering where we can worship together and pray together and learn together and encourage one another together to where God is going to encourage and grow and mature our faith every time we get together. There's some of us as believers who we think that I've been a believer long enough. I don't need people anymore around me. And Paul would say, but I want to be encouraged by you as well. There is so much to the gathering that we miss We believe this to be true. It's in your notes. We become more like Jesus together. We get to draw and grow and help and stretch other people to grow, but we also know there's a good side in there for me. So I prioritize the places I need to be. If I'm supposed to be there, it's not going to happen accidentally. I've got to prioritize it in my week, in my day, in my time. If I'm going to, if I'm going to really grow in my, in my individual discipleship, my discipline of growing and studying alone, I'm going to have to prioritize that. If I'm going to show up in church and I'm going to be engaged in church and not just a, an attender, I've got to prioritize that. And then I've got to prepare my heart and prepare my mind before I even get there. Number three, growth happens when I consume right things. Staying with the seed illustration. If I, put this soil, if I put this seed in some soil, but it doesn't have the right nutrients, doesn't get the water it needs, it's never going to produce good fruit. It may not even grow at all. You've probably heard sayings that are a little cliche, but they make sense. Garbage in, garbage out. 
we understand that we are a product of the things that we most consume. Jesus, quoting a passage from actually back in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, Matthew chapter 4, Matthew wrote it down, verse 4, he says, Jesus says, people don't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right growth requires the right eating plan. As I said, I'm getting older and I'm growing but not necessarily in the ways that I want to grow. When I was younger, younger when, I was, when I was a little more immature, because of how my body was, I could eat just a little bit of good food and a whole lot of junk food, and I could stay relatively healthy. A- as I've matured, I've got to be much more intentional about what I'm consuming. Spiritual body and physical body. Uh, it, it, it takes a lot of fuel to keep this machine running. And if I'm not real intentional about the fuel that I'm putting in it, spiritual fuel, I'm not going to get the results. I'm not going to get the growth that I wanted, that I hoped for, that I was longing for. Number four, growth happens by repetition. Now, that seems really juvenile. That seems really simple, like that's something we teach the littles, but it's not something we should talk about in grown-up service, and I would say that's not true. Marketing agencies would tell you about the rule of seven factor, that, that as a consumer, we need to hear something about, on average, seven times before it sticks in our remembrance to when I go, when I go buy something, that I remember this is the product that I should I should buy. Let me, let me just prove it to you a little bit. Um, complete this sentence for me if you can. Like a good neighbor. Not all y'all have State Farm insurance, but here y'all remembering the jingle. Why? Repetition. But let me try this one for you. It's close to lunchtime, so this will probably help. Give me a break. Give me a break. Break me off a piece of that. Y'all watch too much TV. <laughs> too much TV. Repetition helps us to remember things. Repetition helps us to create right habits. Kit Kat bars, whatever, right or left, not get into the debate. Here's what I know. Maybe is there four Kit Kat bars, one for me and all my, whatever. Here's what I know. There's an incredibly powerful spiritual discipline in recreating habits that most of us think we're too mature to do. Repeating the right things will help us grow and mature in our faith. Habits are an incredible discipline in our maturity. Paul writes to Timothy, still giving instruction on how to run a church. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, he says, Don't waste your time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. How do we train? Athletes, you can relate to this one really quick. How do we train? By doing the same motions over and over again. By repeating the same exercises over and over again. By repeating the same plays multiple times in a row by repeating the same movements. If we're going to grow and mature in our faith, we can't just read this one time and expect it to sow down deep in my heart. Yes, God's word is supernatural and exceeds the bounds of time, but also repetition is helpful. Reminding yourself of it, reminding yourself continually of it, doing it again, it's in your notes. Growth is often hidden in our daily habits and daily routines. Our habits are almost always pushing us toward success and what matters most or pushing us away from success in what matters most. And the last one, apologize. I forgot to put in your notes. That's on me. There's a number five. So if you give me a couple more minutes, I'll give you number five. Number five, probably the one that all hinges on anyway. Growth doesn't happen unless we choose to grow. God is a gentleman. God is not one to force growth upon you. God doesn't impart maturity in those who aren't asking for maturity. God doesn't say just because you got older as a Christian means that you automatically mature like our physical body does. In fact, as a maturing believer, it operates differently than any other facet of life. Growing in our faith, maturing in our faith, it doesn't happen like anything else. In the Old Testament, there's a guy named Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet. He spoke to the Israelites on God's behalf. And in the process, gives like instruction from the Lord. He also presents to us like character and understanding of who God is. Jeremiah 29, 13. Jeremiah says, speaking for God, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. There is always a step of spiritual maturity and growth when we simply wholeheartedly look for God, which means the opposite is true too. As a pastor, I get lots of conversations with people that say something around the point of, you know, I just feel like God's left me. I feel like God has left me alone. God has abandoned me. God is nowhere to be found. And I know what you're saying, and I understand the feeling, but I also want you to know in a step of growth, in a step of maturity, that it has way less to do with God disappearing and way more to do with us wholeheartedly pursuing him. 
You know, sometimes we say things and they sound like good intentions. We say things around here and sometimes even sing songs that there's nothing my God cannot do. And I hate to burst your bubble today, but there are some things that God can't do. For for example, um, God can't tell a lie. I hate to break it to you. Um, God can't tell a lie. Not because of like moral obligation, like I just can't bring myself to tell a lie. I'm God. No, like if God was to pick up this phone and say, this phone is blue, you'd be like, no, it ain't. But you understand because of the nature and the law of how God operates, if God was to say this phone is blue, the phone would become blue. Therefore, God cannot lie. I mean, this is the God who spoke things into existence. God can't tell a lie. It's not actually possible for God to tell a lie. You know, God can't really hide. He's not so good at hide and seek. Hey, God, you want to play hide and seek? No, I'm everywhere. God can't hide. When, when we get to the place where we think that maybe God is hiding from me, it always comes down to, am I really wholeheartedly pursuing him? Or am I trying to see God through the little way, the little tunnel vision that I've had of how I saw him before, and now I don't see him in that same lens? Maybe I need that spiritual healing to take place so I get that different perspective, and that barrier comes down to where I can grow and mature in my faith. Not sensing God's presence has a lot more to do with the condition of my heart and my head. Ultimately, this faith growth, this faith maturity, it comes down to a choice. God is not going to make you grow. God is not going to force maturity or impose maturity onto you, but when we choose to take a step, like Paul said, more and more like Christ, when we choose to take a step to open up our, our, our mind and our heart for God to step in and to do work that only he can do, when we step up to say, I want to grow, God, use me and grow me. God, I know there's going to be growing pains, but I'm anticipating you've got something for me, and to get there, I'm going to have to take a next step with Jesus. And when we choose to grow in our faith, no matter where we are, when we choose to take a step closer to Christ, God is going to show up. God is going to move. God is going to do work to change our heart, to change our mind, which changes the circumstances and our perspective of what's going on around us. And God is going to use each of us as individuals and as Crossroads Community Church to change this world for Jesus. I'm glad you're a part of it. Let me pray with you. God, I thank you. I thank you for yet another day where we get to choose to take a step of growth. God, I thank you for the opportunities that you continue to present in front of us. No matter how many times we've said no, no matter how many times we've messed it up, that God, that you choose to present another growth opportunity for each one of us every day. So God, help us to see those. God, help us to see those places where I need to position and posture myself for you to move, to hear from you, to learn from you, to encounter you every day. God, I thank you for the work you're doing in our church. I thank you for the work that you're preparing for us to do in our community. God, I thank you for the goodness of who you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.